We're in a very brief series, just two weeks. Last week we began it. It's called Once Upon a Time, and it has to do with the two best stories for us to tell. And uh, so we're going to look at what those stories are. We began that last week. And uh, I've chosen as my text this morning a passage from Acts, the 14th chapter. It's significant because uh, this is one of the first occasions we see in the new church where their faith is being shared with people who do not share their understanding of Scripture or share their values. The truth is, is that for lots of us, when we go to share our faith with someone and talk to them about what God's grace has done in our lives, uh, they often hear something very different than what we're attempting to say. And uh, how do you actually have a conversation with people who may very much disagree with the things that you hold true or the things that you value? And that's why this passage is so incredibly helpful to us. It begins in Acts, the 14th chapter, verse 8, and it says, In Lystra there sat a man who was lame. He had been that way from birth, and he had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, Stand up on your feet. At that moment... The man jumped up and began to walk. How many think that would be a great way to end a service? Right there, right? When the crowd saw that Paul, what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. If you know, if you remember way back to your high school days when they taught you about Greek and Roman gods, these are two of the Greek gods. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their clothes and they rushed out into the crowd shouting, Friends, why are you doing this? We too are, what's the next two words? Only human, just like you. We are bringing you good news. We spent quite a bit of time on that last week. Telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way. Yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside of the city thinking he was dead. How many think that's quite a turnaround? Going from wanting to sacrifice to you to throwing stones at you. But after the disciples gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. No kidding. Wouldn't you too? Try a different place. Uh, we're talking about the two most important stories to tell, and last week's story had to do with the gospel, the story of the gospel. The challenge for us is that when we try to share what Christ has done, people often hear it through the paradigm of what they know. And so we talked about three very simple concepts that we must understand if we are to share our faith, and we must be able to explain if people are to hear the gospel. And the first is that the gospel is good news, not just good advice. Some people think the only purpose of Christianity is to tell you how to live your life. But the truth is, is that the, God, the good news, the gospel, tells us what God has done for us so that we can not only be forgiven of all of our faults and failures, but become a forever part of his family. The second thing that we learned is that the moment you place your faith in what Christ did for you on the cross, that very same moment, is when you become a child of God. That you don't have to live a whole life and then be weighting the balances at the end to find out if you deserve to be considered one of the children of God or not. 
It's an incredible concept because in every other religion of the world, you don't know until you pass from this life to the next. But in the Christian faith, the moment you place your faith in Christ, you become a full child of God. The third thing we talked about was that God's kingdom works very differently from all the other kingdoms. We can't make assumptions about God based on how the world works because God's kingdom works very differently. But there is also another story for us to tell. That's the story of the gospel. And this other story is the story of how the gospel changed you. How has the gospel influenced, transformed, and changed your life? The reason why this is an important story is because we actually see from Paul and Barnabas an effort to share the good news with people who don't share their values. Up to this point, all of the evangelism had primarily taken place in Jewish synagogues where people already agreed on the scriptures. The people who were in the room already believed scripture to be true, and they already held the values, and now it was a matter of trying to help them, them to see what Jesus had done based on their understanding. But when Paul goes to Lystra, there is no shared value. In fact, in today's culture, it is not uncommon for people to be completely unfamiliar with concepts or stories in the Bible. One of the things that I've had to learn is that I can't just refer to a story in Scripture. I have to tell a story in Scripture because there are lots of people who don't know what that story is, and if I just refer to it, it does not help them understand. It might actually add to their confusion. On top of that, in our culture, there's not just people who are unaware of what Scripture says and unfamiliar with it. They're actually offended by it. They've heard certain portions of Scripture that just got under their skin. It was often said to them in ways that weren't particularly helpful. And so there are things that they are offended by or that they don't understand. How are we supposed to be able to share our faith to people who don't share our values? They don't accept the Bible as true. They don't believe the same things that we do. This is part of the challenge of the Christian church. And so this is why this story is so important. So what are the things that you can share that are part of your story? Because we all have kind of a similar concept. And in fact, there's a mirror reflection of this to the gospel. And the first is this. Identify what you lived for before you accepted the gospel. What was the most important thing in your life before you accepted the gospel? Why do I refer to this? Well, in the uh, culture that Paul was speaking to, the apostle Paul was speaking to, uh, they had many gods. In fact, they give reference to the Greek gods here. They actually thought that Paul and Barnabas had, had come down incognito as Zeus and Hermes. And so th we, they, they thought that that's what they were, and they actually tried to sacrifice to them. All these gods, and uh, if you've ever been to India, there's over a million gods. I mean, that's a lot of gods. And uh, we think, well, uh, you know, thank God we only have one God. It's easier to keep track of, right? Uh, but I, when I was over in India, what I discovered is, is they think we're crazy because we have one God but a million denominations, and they, they can't figure that out. We just don't get along. So here's how this is. The truth is, is that if you were a soldier in that day, you would make sacrifices to the God of war because you wanted to be successful in battle and you wanted to be advanced in the ranks, get the notice of your superior officers. So you would regularly go to the temple of the God of war and you would offer sacrifices and hope that that God would support your cause. If you were in commerce, let's say that you made something or you sold something, you would want to be successful in your business so that you could have more money for you and for your family. And so they would go to the God of commerce and they would make their sacrifices asking for that God to make their endeavors more profitable. Or maybe you were into agriculture because most of the world was an agrarian society in that time. And so you would go to the God of agriculture and you would ask that the rain would fall on your fields, that the crops would be bountiful, and that the harvest would be abundant. You would go and make your sacrifices every day so that your crops would succeed and that you would be successful in life. 
Or maybe you were all about love and romance, and so you would go to the God of love. It was always one of those. And you could go to the God of love. And let's say uh, back then they didn't have e-harmony and things like that. So you just go to the temple and make an offer and hope that some God would help you out. Uh, or, or how about the, the God of music and arts? Uh, they, would, they actually had such gods. And you would go and you would sacrifice so that if you were artistic or you were musical, maybe you would find a benefactor that would underwrite and subsidize the cost of your continuing to live like that. You see, everyone back then had something they were living for, and everyone today does too. And one of the most important things is to help identify what was it that was the most important thing to you before you were introduced to the gospel. The reason why this is important is whatever is the most important thing in your life is the thing that will control your life. Uh, we think that we are in control of it, but it's not true. If money's the most important thing, then you will sacrifice everything else to get more of it. And by the way, when is enough enough? We don't know the answer to that. I've been told that uh, after you make $400 million, there can be no significant change in your lifestyle if you have more money than that. How many already knew that? Because like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> $400 million. But have you discovered there are people who are billionaires and multi-billionaires? And I haven't seen a single one of them go, yeah, after $400 million, it doesn't matter. I'll just give the rest away. You want some? I, no. They don't do it. What you have is never enough. If the approval of other people is the most important thing to you, you will constantly strive to be able to control their impression of you and their relationship to you by how you act to them. And it becomes the most important thing. If family is the most important thing, you will do whatever it takes to gain their approval and their closeness. And if it's, ever, if it's ever threatened, that just wrecks your world. The problem is not that we pursue wrong things. The problem is that we pursue good things and turn them into God things. That's our challenge. And every single one of us had something that was more important. So figuring that out and how it controlled your life. And then when you met Christ, what difference did that make? That brings us to the second point you can share, and that is how can, what, you can share what, how you came to realize you were broken, that there was something that was not working in your life. Maybe the pressure was just unbearable. You constantly tried to advance and succeed and climb and accomplish more, and it just never ends. The pressure becomes unbearable. Or maybe you just get fed up with the rat race and you want to check out because we all know the only ones who win the rat race are the rats, and that's a problem. Or maybe, you're, maybe you discovered you were sacrificing your family and your friends in order to accomplish other things. Whenever we go through this, this is what we begin to discover. When life is not working for us, we tend to blame others for it not working for us. So maybe it was your parents who didn't, they weren't supportive enough. They didn't equip and train you properly for the world that you were going to live in. Or maybe it was your neighborhood because your neighborhood was abandoned by the cultural connections and influence and economic resources that would have uh, contributed significantly to your ability to be able to advance in life. Or, or maybe your friends just weren't loyal enough. Maybe they were a little bit too self-serving. Or maybe your employer was unfair and didn't appreciate the work that you put in. And then it doesn't stop there, unfortunately. Not only do we try to blame other people, we wind up blaming ourselves. And we start thinking, I am flawed, and I'm not good enough, and I'm not talented enough, and I'm not strong enough, and I'm not, in, I'm not capable enough. And then we get to the place where we even despair of life. And this is what Paul says. This is why this language is so impressive. He stands up and he tells everybody, you are pursuing worthless things. Because at the end of the day, they never keep their promises. You always feel empty. You always want more. It's never enough. When you pursue that stuff, it's never enough. And there came a way in your life where you realized it was just not enough. That leads us to the third thing that you can share. And you can talk about the moment that you realized Jesus came to rescue you. How did that break into your life? How did that conscious thought begin to dawn in your own heart, in your own mind? You see, there comes this moment in time when we're tired of pursuing and sacrificing for the things that leave us empty. And somehow, 
we heard about the good news. In that moment, somehow, we heard about what Christ had done for us, that he paid a price so that all of our faults and all of our failures, all of our mistakes, all of our misdeeds would be forever forgiven, and we would have complete, total, unbridled access to the God who loves us more than we could possibly have imagined. That was the moment that you realized that Christ had come to rescue you, and you discovered God is more kind and more loving and more forgiving than anything you thought was possible. See, what we have to realize about the gods of the ancient culture and the gods of our current culture is that they reward and they punish, but they never forgive. If you give them what they desire, then they will get you what you desire. And if you are not getting what you desire, then that's the punishment of the gods and you need to sacrifice more. The concept of reward and punishment is built in and embedded into the psyche of every religious concept in the face of the planet. But it is only in Christ we see a God who has not come just to reward or just to punish. He has come to forgive. And that is incredibly different than anything else human beings have ever seen. The question is, what kind of difference did that make in your life? How did that affect your heart? How did it affect the way you saw God? Instead of seeing him now as a God who just wants to take from you, one who wants to give to you. Doesn't the Bible tell us? The most famous verse in all the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave. Yes. See, some people just see God as the taker, don't they? Someone dies in their family. What do they say? I don't know why God took them. But why do we say that? We are sure that God is taking, when in fact the gospel reveals that God is giving. How did that impact your life? What did that do regarding the, the pain and this disappointment that you had in your life? And was there someone that God used? Was there a person that maybe you had a conversation with? Was there a ministry that you had an interaction with? Was there a church that actually helped break through the pain and the disappointment of your life and expose you to this incredibly good news of God. That brings us to the last part of your story that you can share, and that is acknowledge that God is continuing to work in your life. Continuing to work in your life. What is God actively doing in your life now? In what ways are you growing? What is being shaped and transformed in you? What are you learning? How are you changing? Because this is what we need to understand. Being a Christian does not mean you have arrived. Being a Christian does not mean that you are perfect. Being a Christian does not mean that you have no more weaknesses. Now, you have to understand, when we go to share our faith, that's what the world thinks you're trying to tell them. I have figured this all out. I have it all together. And you, too, can be like me. I mean, doesn't that just excite you? Doesn't it? I mean, if you ever read marriage books, how to improve your relationship with your spouse, it often comes from that format. Our marriage is so good, so close, so intimate, so hot. You too will want to know how to make your marriage like our marriage. And like after chapter one, you're just gagging. You can't take it anymore. One of the best marriage books I've ever seen in my life was written by two people who, they had a very hard marriage. In fact, that is what their premise of the book is. This is what they say. We are both very strong personalities. Our marriage was really, really hard. And so here's a couple things that we have learned that have helped us to grow closer together in spite of the fact that we often work against each other. Now, how many are already interested in that book? Yeah. <laughs> See, that's the one we want to hear. And when Christians come along and we pretend like we have our act together, you do not. And by the way, people know how to get under your skin, and they will do it. God is still at work. And here's the most amazing thing. In spite of the fact that we still have weaknesses, in spite of the fact that we still don't know it all, in spite of the fact that our act is not completely together, God continues to lead and to guide and to strengthen and to shape, and to teach, and to instruct. So what is God doing in your life right now? Now here's the challenge. And the challenge is to remember to make Jesus the hero of your story. 
A lot of times when we tell our Christian story, we make ourselves the hero. My life was a mess. I was addicted, or I couldn't make good relational connections, or I was wasting everything that had come to me, and then I made a decision, and I made a commitment, and in that story, I is the hero. And you're not the hero of the story of what the gospel has done in your life. Or sometimes we make someone else the hero, a spouse or a friend that didn't give up on us, and they just kept sharing with us, and eventually they wore us down, and they broke through, and thanks to them, I... Oh, be very, very careful. I'm grateful for the faithfulness of friends and family members, but they are not the hero of your story. Or someone will make the church a hero of a story. Oh, and then I went to this amazing church, and the, and the message was so amazing, and the worship was so amazing that I just found out I'm amazing too. And no, 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 no. This is not how it works. I want to, I'm very grateful for what God can do in this place. But please understand, I don't think God is up in heaven going, thank me. Because there's a place like that in Chile. What would I ever do without them? God would still be God. We get to partner with what he is doing, but we don't get to limit what he is doing. He is the hero of our story. Anything God does in this place, it's God doing it in this place. We're happy to create the space. We're happy to create the ministries that allow for what God is doing, but please Understand, we know this beyond a shadow of a doubt. Every person who comes to faith, every person who receives wholeness, every person who experiences healing, every person who is encouraged, it is the work of God's grace in their lives that is making that happen. He is the hero of our story. Amen? It is his grace that is changing our lives. It is his sacrifice that paid the price for our lives. It is his righteousness that has been gifted to us. It is his strength that sustains us. It is his wisdom that guides us. It is his power that overcomes everything we will ever face. It is his spirit that lives within us. Jesus is the hero of our story. And that's how we have to tell it. And here's the most amazing thing. When we do that, God begins to do work in other people's lives. Paul's just preaching the good news. This is how much God loves. This is how much God was willing to do. And all of a sudden, one of the people in the room who had been lame from the time that they were born, never walked a day in his life, never stood on his own, he began to think, if God is that good, I wonder if God could do something for me. And Paul, in his countenance, noticed that God was doing a work of his life. And he just told him, go ahead, stand up, look what God will do. And the man stood up and he jumped and he walked and everybody praised God. Please understand, when you make Jesus the hero of your story, other people are empowered to take steps they never took before and to see things they never saw before and to become what God intended them to be. Let's make Jesus the hero of our story. Let's bow our heads this morning. Even in times of suffering, in times where we're disappointed with ourselves or in others, the hero of our life does not abandon us. He supports, he comforts, he strengthens, he instructs, he shares. And his commitment is he will always be there for us. And he will always be that way to us. This is the gospel. And I know it sounds too good to be true. But what we've discovered is it is true. And it's changing our lives one day at a time. So Heavenly Father, there have been things that we gave ourselves completely for. We thought we would find our significance or our identity in them. And time after time, we were disappointed. It brought pain into our life that we either tried to medicate by the things that we took in or distract ourselves from by the things that we put out. 
But there came this moment in our lives when we discovered we could lay aside all the sacrifices to all the gods of our lives and trust the living and true God that our significance is in you, our hope is in you, and that you will use everything in our life to draw us closer to you. We are grateful for that today, in Jesus' name. Let's stand together. You can build a life on love like this. He's the one that will never let you down. He will never forsake you. In the very darkest moments of life, he's closer than he's ever been. When others break your heart, he's the one who heals it. When you find a God like this, it changes everything. So, Father, I ask, cement into our hearts how incredibly good and how incredibly great you are. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. In just a moment, we're going to receive tithes and offerings. I have to tell you that there's so many good things that happen around here and so many valuable ministries that we have a temptation that we face regularly. And that is that we would take everything that comes in and use it on everything we do here. Because we think ministry to children and ministry to students and ministry to seniors and ministry that reaches out to our community is, is all valuable. And it is. But the truth is one of the evidences that God is in your heart is that he transforms our heart and we make a decision that it's not just about what we can consume. It's about what we can contribute. Um, I have to tell you, um, 
I'm going to be an invited guest at a friend's house tonight to watch the Super Bowl. In case you're wondering, I don't care who wins. <laughs> but this friend's house, it's an unbelievable house, and he has an entire room that's been devoted to creating a multimedia experience. There's a huge wall. The entire wall will be a high-definition projection of the game. The players will actually be larger than life on that wall. And it surrounds sound, so when they hit each other, I feel it. <laughs> and my biggest concern tonight, my biggest concern tonight is that I don't eat too much. First world problem. And so much of our world doesn't have those kind of problems. There are people whose only job today was to find enough food to live one more day. And we think that regardless of your ethnicity or your education, regardless of the geographical location in which you were born, regardless of whether you've ever been around people of faith or not, that nothing, no one should ever be excluded from the grace of God. And so we give away thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars every single year just so that we can reach people who will never give anything back to us. We don't do it for us. We do it because of the grace of God, and it compels us. That's the difference that it makes. And by the way, in case you're wondering, like if you give to missions, every dime goes to missions. But if you don't give to missions, we still give money in and above what comes in to the tune of thousands of dollars. Why do we do it? Because everyone should discover the gospel, that God loves you more than you could possibly know. And he's paid a bigger price than you could possibly imagine so that you could have a better life with him than you ever hoped or dreamed. That's why we do what we do. So, Father, take these gifts that seem small in our own eyes and do astonishing things with them. In Jesus' name, amen.